Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. January 31st, last day of the month, year of our Lord 2021. 13121, it is here. We're heading into February. So much going on. This is Lesson Matthew 274. Lesson 274 of the Matthew series. Today's title is Demonic Forces Are Always Related to Child Abuse in Any Form. Any realm, any form of child abuse is demonic related. Demonic forces are always related to child abuse in any form. We're going to look at some delicate subject matter in the next few lessons. So buckle up, as I told you last time. I want to give a shout out to Sean in uh, Georgia. I just spoke to Sean on the phone. She's very helpful. Her and her brother, her family in the Georgia area are going to be helping my wife and I out. I believe they're at least guiding us in the right direction. And I'm very humbled by that type of help. So thank you so much. Please keep that in prayer. We do have to make a transition and a move probably in April of this coming year. So in a few months, I have to transition to another state down south. That'll be around the first week of April. And I think we have some royal family members in Georgia that might be able to help us out. And, you know, it gave me an idea, um, probably God, the Holy Spirit leading me. I hope maybe I can do a small conference in Georgia on my way down to Florida. So um, keep that in prayer that maybe um, during that transition down there, we get a long weekend and maybe I get a small little building I can set up down there and do a uh, stopover and do a weekend conference there in Georgia. That would be awesome. That just came to my mind about 20 minutes ago. So um, having said that, I want to thank Royal family there in Georgia, uh, Shauna and her brother and whoever else down there is going to help us and guide us uh, for that April transition. Please keep everything in prayer in this country, across this world, so much going on. I appreciate the prayers from my wife and I. You know, when it comes to downsizing and preparing to move and all these things, it takes several months to put these things together. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. I'm a little tired, but um, keep pressing forward. And um, I know God, the Holy Spirit, is just guiding me and leading me, and I can feel God's presence um, in, in my life, moving me forward in the ministry. So I'm so pleased with that that um, it's giving me that extra burst of energy when I need it. So things are going to be busy for me the next 60 days or so. Um, it is what it is, but uh, I can feel God at work again. I thank everybody. So having said that, I think we're going to jump into it, and uh, we're going to keep everything in prayer, whether it's people dealing with illnesses, the vaccine issues, the separation and division politically here in America, across the globe. So much is going on, so let us jump into it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word of God, so that by it you may grow, I may grow, we all may grow in respect to our salvation. Preparing to take in the Word of God, you have to wash yourself clean of any known sins. That way you are filled with that power of God, the Holy Spirit, reflecting the nature of Jesus Christ walking in that new nature. 1 John 1.8 tells the believers, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, meaning any sins you might have forgotten about or didn't even realize. 1 John 1.10 goes on to say, believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, his word is not in us. Let's take a moment of silent prayer right now and wash the sin from our life, the garbage and distractions, get filled with the Spirit, walk in that new nature, get ready to have fellowship with God and take in the Word of God. The most important part of your day should be taking in the Word of God. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're just asking you to touch those people that have recently reached out to my wife and I to help us out down there in Georgia, that family in Georgia, Father. Protect them and bless them. And just with the, their grace orientation, what they're offering, Father, whether it comes through or not, just the offer itself is coming from a place of grace and, and spiritual maturity, I believe, Father. So we're asking for that blessing. We're asking for your healing hand across this world concerning vaccines and viruses, Father. We're asking for your healing hand 
in Washington, D.C., that the truth be revealed and that division and lies come to the surface and that we can sort through the nonsense and the deception, Father, and get to the truth and that we can come together, Father, as as believers and as a, as a country and come together here and even across the world. So much division, so many lies, so many things going on, Father. We're just seeking your word and your truth and your transparency, Father, so we can become the mature believers that are part of the pivot, part of the remnant that remain, that can lead others to the truth, Father. We're asking all these things. We're asking for blessings to fall upon not this, just this ministry here, Father, but any ministry teaching truth and those that support it through your son's precious name. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me grab a drink and we will jump into it. Demonic forces are always related to child abuse. Any form, folks. We're going to get into a series that's a little touchy. God the Holy Spirit's leading me here, so I hope you're going to learn a lot. But it is going to feel a little uncomfortable at times with some things I have to uncover. So we're going to talk about these things. Being in the Word of God does not mean you avoid uncomfortable subject matter. Sometimes it means you tear deep into uncomfortable subject matter when you teach. So, we are about to embark on a three to five part series that is difficult. It is difficult, delicate subject matter, so please understand that this ministry is geared toward adults. Okay, I don't sell anything on my channels, and I also don't promote anything for uh, young children to learn on this channel. This is an adult channel for spiritually uh, mature believers or believers who are interested in becoming spiritually mature. So we cover adult matter sometimes. Most of what I teach is on an adult level. It is not suited for prep school teaching unless you have a solid teacher who can break down these words and these principles and concepts to an understandable and appropriate level for children. So having said that, that's my disclaimer going forward in this series. Last lesson, we looked at the dual meaning of what? Matthew 18, 5, and 6. That's where we're at. And I pointed out the stumbling block principle in Matthew 18, 5, and 6. Now it's time to peel back the second layer of the meaning and dig a little deeper. And how do we do that? We really have to get into where this principle came from. You have to go back in Scripture and find out some of the first times you see a principle or a doctrine come up and investigate it and then really dig into it. That's what we're going to do today. So Matthew 18.5, pick it up there. Matthew 18.5 on the board. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, Jesus said. But whoever, in verse 6, causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, and I showed you the fact that it was talking about believers, but the secondary meaning was children, it would be better for him to have a heavy milestone, millstone, I keep saying milestone, millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. I covered this principle a little bit last lesson. Again, we're digging into a secondary layer of this here. The millstone was brought up in the Bible on several occasions. It was a common grinding instrument for many of you farmers you might know the history of a, a millstone a grinding instrument for breaking down wheat and grain they were initially very large and bulky but over time they were fashioned smaller and lighter uh, but way back in the ancient world they were big and bulky made of big stones they had two sizes two sizes the smaller circular stone on top and then a larger circular stone on the bottom the one the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is warning about was probably the millstone on the bottom. So we're talking about the big, heavy, bulky millstone on the bottom section, driven by farm animals like donkeys that push them around in a circle, moving in a continued circle. That millstone was easily, back then, 100 pounds or greater. So just think about that. You're talking about a boulder, 100 pounds or more. Knowing that Jesus is pointing out having a massive rock tied to your neck and thrown into the ocean to drown in your death, we get a sense of the serious nature of the statement. Amen? Everybody understand the serious nature, then, of this statement? And I don't often like to jump ahead, so as not, I don't want to cause confusion in a study, but for today we have to highlight something, so we have to skip ahead a verse or two, something just a few scriptures away. I'll put it on the board for you, but I often don't like to do this because it kind of um, it confuses people. So we're in Matthew 
18, 5, and 6, but we have to jump ahead to verse 10 to look at something, which eventually I will cover in the future, but we're going to get to the core of a principle right now, and it's important for us to look at, so please don't jump ahead and get confused. Simply look on the board. Matthew 18, 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, he's going over a principle that has a dual meaning, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Again, a dual meaning, believers and children. That's the dual meaning. Coincides with the dual principle of what? Believers and the secondary warnings I was telling you about, about child abuse. Difficult subject, but you cover difficult subjects in the Word of God. The Word of God, the teaching of the Word of God is not supposed to always be about fluffy messages and fun stories that the pastor tickles your ears with. In fact, that is some weak teaching, I would say, and I know that's going to insult some people, but oh well, am I your enemy for telling you the truth? So, this coincides with the dual principle of believers and the secondary principle of warning on child abuse. This also, right here, answers a question about what? Guardian angels. There's at least four or five scriptures I can show you in the Bible, and certainly at least three or four of them probably in the New Testament, that point to guardian angels. It's a pretty clear statement, which I've taught that Bible uh, points to angelic forces watching over us. I've taught, I've taught that before. I know the man who ordained me at Grace Bible Church, Pastor Robert McLaughlin, and my spiritual grandfather, Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., also taught these principles that there are guardian angels. It is pointed out in Scripture. We just simply don't know how it all operates, but it is pointed out in Scripture. So that's one right there you're looking at. Now, sacrifice of children. You're going to have to look at these tough principles, folks, for us to dig deep and see where the history of child abuse began. Sacrifice of children is forbidden. It always has been. It is one of the commands in Scripture that carries through every dispensation, every age, so you can never find a loophole where you could say, well, this age or this dispensation or this Scripture says we don't have to worry about abusing children anymore. You can't find it. You can't find it in any scripture, any dispensation, any age. Leviticus 18.21 tells us, You shall not give any of your offspring to offer them to Moloch. And we know this is one of the foreign gods, the fallen angels. Nor shall you profane the name of your Lord, I am the Lord God, I am your Lord. Understand this principle. There is no other scripture, New Testament, Old Testament, that you can find that it's okay to do something evil with children. No scripture. None. Now, there are some scriptures that say some things that will put something into question that I can explain to you we're not going to get in today. Actually, the commands in Leviticus chapter 18, if you read Leviticus chapter 18, they were put in place for all believers, not just Jews. All believers can learn from Leviticus chapter 18. There is no scripture in the New Testament that tells us anything different. Therefore, we can assume a chapter like Leviticus chapter 18 can carry over into the church age. Well, how do you know which dispensation you stop doing something, which dispensation you don't? You look for the New Testament. Scripture has to line up with Scripture. Scripture has to line up with Scripture. You have to understand the historical context. Then you have to understand, is this a shadow principle, something in the Old Testament that carries into the New Testament? How does it carry into the New Testament? Or is there something in the New Testament teaching of Peter, Paul, and John and the apostles that tell you stop doing this and transition over to this? I can tell you right now, read Leviticus chapter 18. There's almost nothing in there that you can take away and say, well, this changed in the New Testament. Just letting you know. Many commands given to the nation of Israel have great value for the church age believers and we need to see how they line up with new testament scriptures and principles understand that many commands given to the na nation of israel have great value for the church age believer we need to see how they line up with new testament scriptures and principles please understand you need to know your bible turn to leviticus chapter 20 go to the old testament leviticus chapter 20 Read Leviticus 18 on your own time, that whole chapter, and I'll tell you almost everything in there applies for church age. Everything. Leviticus chapter 20, royal family. 
What the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the apostles taught needs to be our main focus. New Testament principles, mystery doctrine of the church age. Yet, we cannot deny principles or commands given in the Old Testament if they align properly with New Testament teaching. Let me say that again. What the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the apostles taught need to be our main focus in the church age. Certainly, mystery doctrine of the church age. We need to focus on much of the New Testament. All of it really applies to the church age. But we cannot deny principles or commands given in the Old Testament if, big if, if they align properly with New Testament teaching. In other words, as an example, in Genesis chapter uh, 2, what do you find? The first mentioned principle of a marriage, Christian marriage. Genesis chapter 2, this is an example. Christian marriage or the sacred union between a real man and a real woman. First mentioned principle. That never changes anywhere in scripture. You never see divorce is okay and marrying 10 different women is okay and a man and a man marry. You never see any of that anywhere in scripture. That first mentioned principle in Genesis chapter 2 carries all the way over to Revelation. That's a staple understand that. We know all the Ten Commandments and Jewish laws or rituals were fulfilled in what? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's clear in New Testament scriptures. The Ten Commandments, Mosaic laws, the rituals, all fulfilled in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are told specifically that the age of Israel and the Mosaic law are no longer the focus for the church age believer. I've taught that from this pulpit. Many men that understand dispensations and church age mystery doctrine have taught that as well. So understand these principles. But a chapter like Leviticus chapter 18 that I told you to read, and many principles encapsulated in that chapter, principles encapsulated in that chapter are never changed in the plan of God at any juncture, at any dispensation. You can't find where it's changed. That becomes important to understand. If you are not a serious student of the word, you may be confused with this concept that I'm telling you. And unfortunately, we're going on a, a pretty deep uh, study about uh, child abuse, so I'm not going to get into um, pointing out these principles. I'm trying to give you examples, and I use Christian marriage in Genesis chapter 2 as a good example. That never changed. You couldn't find in the New Testament that Jesus said, yeah, that principle of man and woman marrying, no big deal. You can divorce. You can marry who you want. You can marry five different people. You can marry in the same sex, blah, blah, blah. None of that. None of that. You cannot find it. So you have to stick with that principle all through the Bible. Please understand that. That doesn't, that doesn't nullify dispensations. It just means maybe you don't understand dispensations and what carries over. The reason God gives warnings about child sacrifice is because it was becoming common practice by pagan tribes who worshipped what? Fallen angels. That's where most of the false gods came from. Fallen angels and the image of fallen angels like the god Moloch. And there's different ways to pr uh, pronounce that name. Moloch, a Moloch, and spell it. Leviticus 21. Pick it up in Leviticus 21. I hope I made it clear about certain principles, certain commands, or certain natural laws that God had laid down in the Old Testament that carry well into the New Testament. Unless you can find something different in the New Testament, you don't change it. Understand that principle. Unless you can find Scripture that lines up with Scripture and go into the New Testament teaching and say, oh, this is a clear pivot point where something changed, then you don't change it. That's basically the way, the basic where the rubber meets the road way that I can explain that to you. Leviticus 21. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying what? Leviticus 22 on the board. You shall also say to the sons of Israel, any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Moloch. Like I said, there's two or three different spellings you can find through theology. But that's how the, the basic spelling of Moloch is shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. This is a serious indictment. This is a serious command. This here as well, Leviticus 20 verse 2, never changes. You never see the apostles or Jesus say, yeah, it's okay to worship mullet. 
or any other fallen gods under Baal or any other system. That never changes. Understand that principle. A very serious offense you're looking at. Any form of child abuse is against the word of God. Never in the New Testament, Old Testament, anywhere is child abuse approved of. Spanking a child is not child abuse. So that's going to be part of our lesson probably in the next or the lesson after the next. I'm going to have to get into that. Yes, disciplining a child. I'm not talking about abuse. Two different things. But this is a very serious offense you're looking at here. Any form of child abuse is against the word of God. In fact, the only time, listen to me carefully because I know somebody's going to find certain scriptures and I might have to point them out in this study. But any time you see God approve of killing children in scripture, it has to do with wiping out an evil empire and wiping them out completely because they've gone so deep into evil practices that every generation will be affected no matter what. That will answer a lot of questions right there before you send me any questions. Meaning, even their children who would grow up under satanic principles would not come to believe. And therefore, God brings those innocent children home early to his kingdom. Well, what do you mean? God approved the killing of children. Listen, there's a couple of scriptures. I know many of you are thinking about them. I might have to touch on them in this series. But before you ask the question, understand, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows if that child would stay in that evil form of worship like his fathers and forefathers before him, and therefore God had to wipe out a whole generation of people. Yes, that's in Scripture. There is explanations. Leviticus 23. I don't want to get sidetracked on anything. Stick through the whole study and then ask questions. Stick around for the next three or four hours of teaching on this principles I'm going to get into, and then ask the questions. Leviticus 23. I will also set my face against that man, will cut him off from among his people. This is a serious indictment, because he has given some of his offspring to who? Mullet, a foreign god, a fallen angel, so as to defile my sanctuary, to profane my holy name. Leviticus 24, if the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offspring to Mullet, so as not to put him to death, in other words, don't follow my commands on what I'm telling you, Leviticus 25, then I myself, God is saying, will set my face against that man and against his family that doesn't think this is a big deal. So just understand that. It's just like when you know a crime was committed and you don't go to the police. You're kind of an accessory to the crime. God takes this crime very serious, just so you know. Well, I knew so-and-so was abusing that child, but I didn't want to say nothing. I didn't want to cause any problems. Be very careful. I'd suggest you read Leviticus 25. Then I myself will set my face against the man and against his whole family, and I will cut off them from among their people. In other words, all their blessings are stopped, both him and all those who play the harlot after him, by playing the harlot after Mullet, which is giving yourself over to evil. God anticipated the Jews' contact with heathen Gentiles like who? Canaanites, for one. All God's warnings about such problems were designed by God to protect Judah and all the nation of Israel, really. The worship of Moloch was associated with child sacrifice. There is no way around it. It's in the history books, folks. Moloch is the name of the second image of the Phalic cult. I've covered this before. Sexual perversion of cult. Jezebel was a queen of that. The second image of the Phalic cult in equivalent to Baal or Baal is how sometimes you pronounce it, which means Lord. Many gods and goddesses were under the Baal system and believed to be sons and daughters of the one powerful god Baal. That's where all these gods and goddesses came from. If you look at ancient history, they believed it came under one god system, Baal, which may well have been Satan himself, or another fallen angel of high rank involved in the Genesis 6 sexual debacle. The Genesis 6 sexual debacle. Again, I'll leave this on the board. This is historic, folks. This is history. Whether you believe in false gods, fallen angels, whatever you believe, I can tell you the Word of God points to many of these false gods that came up and that were worshipped and the images that were worshipped were connected to fallen angels and many came from the sexual debacle of Genesis chapter 6. 
When I did an angel study several years ago at Grace Bible Church, gbible.org, where I was ordained, I got into some of these principles. This is before the flood, Genesis chapter 6, when a group of what? Fallen angels believed to be of powerful demonic nature had sexual relations with human women and created what? A super race giants we would call Nephilim. Do your research. Many of you are well schooled. You know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about the giants, Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6. It is from those demonic angels and their offspring that all false god systems sprang up to life. So we're going back historically right to the root to look at child abuse and some forms of child abuse. It is from the demonic angels and their offspring that all these false god systems sprang to life. It goes that back that far to before the flood. Many know them today as what? Zeus. Many scholars, uh, biblical scholars, believe Zeus is Satan. Hercules, Apollo, there's many of them. Because that's what the Greek mythology labeled them. And the Greek mythology, for some reason or other, was very strong. And it stuck because even in the English-American school system, the Greek mythology was taught when I was in 6th uh, and 7th grade. I can remember learning about it. And they were just mythology. But honestly, if you dig through mythology, you find a root of truth somewhere. They're fallen angels. That's your root of truth. Moloch is one of the more powerful gods in this system. And almost all of them revolved around human sacrifice. A lot of these gods had human sacrifice as part of their worship. Sexual orgies. Again, I remind you, this is for big boys and big girls. Sexual orgies and perverted behaviors were common practice in the rituals. The majority of these gods in ancient times involved in perversion and very cruel rituals. Wicked and cruel rituals. With Moloch, it often involved babies and children being abused sexually or physically by leadership in the form of worship that ended in human sacrifice. So in other words, it was almost like this ritual service that went on for hours or days and a final result was a human sacrifice or a child or a baby sacrifice. It's in scripture, folks. This is not me, Pastor Rick, making it off the top of his head. This is the word of God. 2 Kings 23.10 he also defiled himself, Topath, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire of Moloch, this fallen angel, this false god. This was a ritual of worship that involved intoxication. Yes, alcohol has been around a long time. Not just alcohol, certain berries and leaves and different things where it makes you intoxicated. Really, uh, pharmacia, magical spells that came from different mixtures of berries and chemicals and alcohol. So the ritual things that happened, the worships, involved not only sexual orgies, but they used forms of intoxication, sexual orgies that reached their peak at the burning or killing of screaming children and adults alike. I know this is tough to digest. I'm just going to let you know. Sadly, some of these things have carried on today. I'm going to have to touch on this during this series. This was a ritual of worship that involved intoxication, sexual orgies that reached their peak at the burning or killing and screaming of children and adults alike. Screams of burning children were used to arouse the sexual activities at the statues and idols. The mother was attacked sometimes and raped. The screams of the mother and child blended in a worship of Moloch, and there is even some historians that believe they would carve a baby out of a pregnant woman's stomach and use that as well as a form of worship and sacrifice. This is all adult stuff, folks. Sorry to tell you, this is factual. Jeremiah 32, 35. I know this is hard. I knew when I taught this, we're going to be getting into some subject matter in the next few hours, next few lessons. Going to be very difficult to digest. Jeremiah 32, 35. They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben Hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Mullet. This is not a one time event. This is all over the Old Testament scriptures, folks. Which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind, God said, that they should do this abomination, awful, wicked, evil thing to cause Judah to sin. Moloch to this very day. To this very day, Moloch is worshipped in satanic circles. And people are going to say, what do you mean? 
There's a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to have to touch on some things. And you see images of bull heads and horns. That's the horned god Moloch in imagery, satanic writings that bled right into the 1600s, 1700s, and into demonic culture today. Yes, it's been around. It's found its way through different types of things. And you really, when it's found its way into the 16 and 1700s, wealthy families and the very elite got into some pretty bizarre practices. To, to this very day, certain wealthy elite are still into it. Having said that, let's move forward. Canaanites, Moabites, Ammonites, Babylonians all paid heed to Moloch along with several other gods under the Baal system. So almost all of them, Canaanites, Moabites, Ammonites, uh, the Philistines had um, the fish god head. I mean, they, had, they all had these different gods that all fell under the fallen angels from Genesis chapter 6. The Nephilim and the fallen angels. Canaanites, Moabites, Ammonites, Babylonians all paid heed to Moloch along with several under, other gods under the Baal system. Solomon, in fact, became apostate. He built high places for the worship of Moloch. Why did Solomon do that? He was a good Christian man. That's the son of David. Because of lust patterns in Solomon's soul, he chased the women. And the women he chased oftentimes were not Christian women, which gets men in a lot of trouble. And ladies, it gets you in a lot of trouble when you think, oh, I'll get him born again and saved. Be very careful. 1 Kings 11, 7. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab. There's another one. On the mountain, which is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, another one. Two of them. The detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. There you have right there. One of the reasons Solomon's kingdom got split up, Israel got split up. One of the reasons there was a split in the nation of Israel is because of King Solomon. Poor choices in wives plural, which he had no business doing, and allowing their false systems of worship into the nation of Israel. One of the reasons the divisions happened in Israel. And by the way, God never approved of man having several wives. I know it's in scripture. It's never approved. The first mentioned principle, Genesis chapter 2, I began this study with. What did it tell you? One man, one woman. One biological man in our day and age, one biological woman. That's Christian marriage. God never approved a man having several wives. He allowed certain things in his permissive will. Almost every time a man of God, no matter who it was, Abraham, any of them, David, Solomon, every time a man of God led that lifestyle of polygamy, it's called, it brought misery and confusion into the household and some form of discipline. The family always had divisions and problems later on. All the time. Need I remind you of Abraham and Hagar? And what Sarah and Hagar and Abraham did? Need I remind you of David and Bathsheba and David's different wives and concubines and Solomon? You're seeing right here. God never approved of man having several wives. That first mentioned principle never changed all the way through Scripture. God allows certain things, but he also reap what you sow and face the discipline. King Ahaz... King Ahaz in 730 B.C. burned children's sacrifice. Ahaz was of the bloodline, royal bloodline under King David. And he was the father of Hezekiah. And he did the same thing. He was weak and foolish and he chased after foreign gods. He died around the age of 36, I would say, sit on to death. God actually made sure the day that Ahaz died, he was buried, that the sun miraculously only was shining for a couple hours in the morning. That was it. One of those bizarre days, nobody can explain why it was dark all day and the sun only came up and went down so quickly. Second Chronicles 28, 1 Chronicles 28.1 Ahaz, bloodline of David, was 21, 20 years old Excuse me, when he became king. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and he did not do right in the sight of the Lord as David his father has done. Ahaz, which is short for Jehoaz the second. He was constantly humiliated in battle. He kept reaping what he sowed. He wasn't a winner in battle. And he became a puppet and a fool, a puppet king for other people. Second Chronicles 28.2 goes on to say what? But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Many of them did. And he also made molten images, idols to who? 
bowels, notice plural, the bowel system, many gods and goddesses. Verse 3, moreover, he burned incense in the valley of Ben Hinnom, which means outside the area of Jerusalem was a dung burning heap and burned his sons in fire according to the abominations of nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel. So he allowed the false gods in. He set up a section that was supposed to be the dumpster area, the Gahana burning area, and he turned it into, okay, we can also burn bodies and worship out there while we burn the garbage. A man after God's own heart, David, in his bloodline. Look what Ahaz does. King Manasseh, another one. King Manasseh also offered his children to false gods. 2 Kings 21. 2 Kings 21, 3. For Manasseh, he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed, and he erected altars for what? Baal. And made an Ashroth, which is a female goddess, fertility, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Notice the cycle we're in here. Notice the problems we're having here. This is all revolving around our study in child abuse to get us introduced to how far back some of this evil goes. These were generational issues I'm showing you. Generational issues that would skip a generation and then come back up years later and the leadership and people fell right back into the worship of false gods. They'd get rescued from it and a period would go by and they'd get back into the word of God and then they would fall again. Generational issues. Maybe skip a generation here and there. And Ashrod that you see on the board was the feminine goddess, usually representing fertility. They were usually these wooden poles they, they erected that were re representing the goddess of fertility, but also worshipped with sexual, perverted acts and ritualistic behaviors for that goddess as well. Just so you understand. Nothing good comes from false gods. 2 Kings 21.4 and he built altars in the house of God, in the house, not outside, in, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name, verse 5, for he built altars for all the most heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, inside. This is what happened once a false idol or a foreign god came into the nation of Israel, every time. They would set up temples and idols right next to the place they had to worship for God. And you see inside, they would do it outside, and they would start inside the holy temple itself. They would erect a new altar for false worship and sacrifice right next to their altar for God. Remember something, folks. The temple and the altar are shadows of what was to come concerning the soul of the church-age believer. So when we look back on the Old Testament scriptures like I'm showing you, that temple is a shadow for the church-age believer in our soul structure where the Trinity is indwelting. That altar and that temple is inside our soul structure today. So think about that. When a believer begins to worship idols, and anything can become an idol, folks, anything you put above God. You start worshiping idols today in cosmic system agendas or false teaching, it's similar to what the nation of Israel did during those ancient times, but it's in our soul structure. Today, that was the shadow back then of what's in the church age soul structure. 2 Kings 21.6, he made his sons pass through fire, practice witchcraft, use divination, dealt with mediums, spiritists. This is all dark arts. This is all satanic arts. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. You can see the history. It's riddled throughout the Old Testament. Witchcraft is that Hebrew noun, Hanan. Hebrew verb, excuse me, anon. It's actually in a verb because it's an action. Divination is nashka. And the mediums of spiritists are ovas and yadonai. So all of these words I have on the board, I'll read them to you. Witchcraft is the Hebrew verb because it was an action, anon. And the divination is nashkash. And the mediums of spiritists are ova and yadonai. Witchcraft meaning dark arts of sorcery. That's exactly what it means in the Hebrew. And Nashkash is divination, chanting or incantation. You know how you chant or conjure up a spell? These are all real things, folks. This isn't just Hollywood. This is reality. Like I tell people all the time, maybe it's just a small portion of satanic evil, but it is real. It is real. Medium. You look at the word for medium, speaking with the dead. 
touching into the spirit world. I tell people all the time, don't even play around with those. What are those Ouija boards? You're messing with something you have no idea. Do not play around with astrology, Ouija boards, and tarot cards, and all those things, because that's what this speaks of. Speaking with the dead and mediums between spirit worlds trying to connect. Spiritus is the other one, one who's developed powers. It really means a wizard. A wizard. One who's into spells and incantations and touches spirits and gets involved with potions and spells. A wizard is one of the words for spiritus in the original Hebrew. There they are on the board. Please take note of them. This is no joke. This isn't, uh, you know, Friday the 13th and Freddy Krueger movies of Hollywood. This is real, folks. This is real and something you should never play with. As a believer, you cannot be possessed. But as a believer, you can be deeply influenced by evil if you get in the periphery of these things. As an unbeliever, this is about possession. And it's possession by some really powerful demonic beings and angels that you do not want to play with, folks. There is a supernatural world. Listen to me. There is a supernatural world of demonic forces that people can touch into that is devastating for your soul structure, and it leads to possession if you're an unbeliever and demon influence if you're a believer. Just so you know. Under King Hosea, Samaria was judged. They, they did child sacrifices there as well. Samaria was the centerpiece, really, and respected region in the northern tribe of Israel, but would later become the root of embarrassment, Samaria, for the Jews in the days of the apostles. But at one point, it was a centerpiece of the northern tribe of Israel because it was so watered down by all kinds of foreign cultures and mixed bloodlines were prevalent in the cities. By the time Jesus and his humanity walked the earth, it was no longer a respected Jewish region. That's why you see in the New Testament, the Jews, the really staunch Jews, avoided Samaria. They go around it. But at one point, in the ancient times, in the, in the northern kingdom, it was the centerpiece. That goes to show you how far you can get dragged down into evil. 2 Kings 17, 17. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire, practice divination, enchantments, there it is again, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him. Verse 18, so the Lord was very angry with Israel, removed them from his sight, excuse me, none was left except the tribe of Judah. You see a demise of a whole nation, a whole group of people when evil gets in there. That's why as a nation, you need to be very careful that you don't get away from your founding principles if they're tied to biblical principles and you're a nation unto God. What I'm showing you is this was not a one-time event, folks. I needed to show you the history. This was not a one-time event. It kept coming back every 10 or 15 years or so. The northern and southern tribes of Israel would fall into this habitually, repeatedly. Remember, the nation of Israel is a shadow of the coming church age of Christ that we live in. So we have to pay attention. The church itself, Israel, was kind of a shadow of the coming church age, really even more so. Israel was a shadow of the soul of every church age believer, which is a much more personal look at individual believers today. So really at a more personal level, Israel was a shadow of the each of us, a church age believer, our soul structure. Think about it that. That's a very much more of an individual and a personal touch today for believers. Every other cycle of a new king in Israel, northern or southern tribe, would bring in change for the worse or for the better. Every other cycle of a king, you study the northern and southern tribes, see what happened from the time of Solomon allowing it in, the different things that happened. Every other cycle, northern or southern tribe, you see a cycle of a new king coming in, They'd either be for God or against God. They might start out as good believers and they would go astray because of influence and outside forces. In 640 BC, Josiah became king of Judah, a southern tribe. He destroyed the high places of Moloch in 2 Kings 23. If you look at 2 Kings 23, uh, 10 through 13, 640 BC, King Josiah. He destroyed the high places, he did the right thing. But when he died in battle, what happened? The Jews returned to the Phalic cult again through Josiah's eldest son, Jehoiakim. 
Many of you know these names. So what happens? His own son turns against what the father did. The father's godly. The son takes over the throne. He reverses everything the father did. This was a common cycle of rebellion, folks. A common cycle of rebellion. God's people, since the birth of the nation of Israel, through Father Abraham, you see it repetitively. In fact, we look at the original man and woman in the garden, and we see rebellion. What happened in the garden? That was a form of rebellion. That form of rebellion in the garden was reflecting the rebellion that Satan had and the fallen angels had. So we look at original man and woman in the garden. We see rebellion when they followed the enticement of Satan as a serpent because Satan knew, oh, I know how to get him. I know all about pride. I know all about separation. I know all about rebellion. I'm the king of it. I'm the father of it and deception. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 19. We're going to close in about 10 minutes here. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 19. We're going to prepare to close in a little bit. There's a lot I'm giving you. I'm trying not to rush through it, but I wanted to get this all in as a basic um, introduction and where the history of some child abuse and demonic forces related to child abuse came from, and they stem from satanic forces, fallen angel forces. There's no other way around it. Anybody you know involved in child abuse, and I'm not talking about spanking a five or six year old kid the proper way if you're the mother or father or parental figure i'm talking about child abuse on different levels real child abuse it's satanic at its core i'm showing you where it came from god would send his leaders who were touched by the holy spirit to call the jews back every time god always calls us back you guys are going to jeremiah chapter 19 but God always touched those leaders and those prophets to call his people back and remind them. And honestly, the true prophets always condemn the cults. Always. That was one of the first things God had them do. You can look at Jeremiah 7, 29, 34, Amos chapter 5, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 20 through 22. Yet the principle of the short-term memory applied back then as it does today. What do I mean by the principle of the short-term memory? I use the term... Uh, the rear view mirror. You know how you look in your rear view mirror and you're driving your car and for a little while you can see what's going behind you. Eventually it disappears in your rear view mirror. That's the short term memory we all have, believer or unbeliever. Once people get past a problem, a difficulty, or even discipline, it's very common for the months or years to melt away pretty quickly. The bad memories and the lesson learned disappear in that rear view mirror. Big problem for humanity. Short term memory. The rear view mirror only holds that image so long. Next time you drive in the car and look in the rear view mirror, see how long that fence post keeps in that mirror as you go by it and how quickly it disappears. That's how quickly human beings forget what God has done for them and forget problems and discipline that have come in their life in the past. Not trying to make anybody feel guilty, but I often use 9-11 as an example. Anybody remember 9-11? The church I was ordained at, Grace Bible Church in Somerset, Mass., under Pastor Bob, was packed. Was packed after the days after the 9-11 attacks. American flags were everywhere. I remember. We pulled all together. People ran to God the days and weeks after 9-11. Three months later, three months later after 9-11, the attendance at the church dwindled. Three more months after that, which would have been six months after 9-11, we were back to the normal attendance and the American flags began to disappear again. I always remind people that's how crooked politicians keep getting elected besides the voter fraud because they've been manipulating voter fraud for years. But how do they keep getting elected? And how are they staying in office 15, 20, and 30 years? Crooked politicians. They count on us having what? Short-term memory. They count on us having short-term memory and the propaganda and the lies to cover everything up. And we just kept forgiving or forgetting, really. And they keep getting in office with some little help from fraud. The prophet Jeremiah was assigned to the southern tribe of Judah. And as a prophet between 1627 B.C. right up until about 536 B.C., that's what Jeremiah did. Jeremiah had his reputation under attack 
verbal attacks everywhere he went, his reputation, false accusations thrown at him, but he kept on preaching and teaching the Word of God, whether it was in season or out of season, popular or unpopular, his reputation being under attack, Jeremiah kept pressing on. Jeremiah 19.1. Look at Jeremiah 19.1. Thus says the Lord, go and buy a potter's earthen ware jar, and take some of the elders of the people and some of the senior priests. This lesson of the potter's clay, or the potter's jar, was also something Paul taught in 2 Corinthians, if you remember that. Meaning God is the creator of all things. He's the potter, we're the clay. God is the creator of all things, and there would be an example of how the potter's jar can be easily broken. And the potter can decide what he wants to destroy and rebuild. Jeremiah 19, 2. Then go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom, which was by the entrance of the postern gate, <clears throat> excuse me, and proclaim there the words that I tell you, Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit's working with Jeremiah, coming down upon that prophet. Jeremiah 19, 3, and he said, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'm about to bring calamity upon this place, as which the ears of everyone that hears of it will tingle. Jeremiah 19, 4, I put on the board for you. Because they have forsaken me, this is the warning, and have made this an alien place and have burned sacrifices, here it is again, into other gods that neither they nor their forefathers nor the kings of Judah had ever known, these foreign gods. And because they have filled this place with the blood of innocent, what does that mean? Children, babies, virgins, innocent, human blood. This points us to not only human sacrifice such as virgins, but children and newborn babies. That's what was going on. Jeremiah 19.5 goes on to say, And have built the high places of Baal, there we are again, to burn down their sons in fire, Boy, that rearview mirror. Things disappear pretty quick. Built the high places again of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, a thing which I never commanded or spoke of, never did it even enter my mind. It is so evil. Could not be associated with God. The reason the Jews would get caught up in false gods, demonic worship, was because they kept straying away from the true God of Israel. They get bored. They get apathetic. They get lazy, whatever word you want to use. And eventually, they start looking at the shiny objects out in the cosmic system and the different cultures and gods and other things outside the plan of God. And eventually, they stray away from the one true God. They allowed cosmic influence foreigners into their midst and now you're going to say well, what do you mean you know you're against foreigners no we're all foreigners here in america we all are listen my grandfather came from canada okay and then if i try trace the bloodline on my mom's side the scotch irish they came from ireland or scotland or whatever but they were allowing foreigners in and there was something going on here god always told them welcome a foreigner in. welcome a foreigner in god told them but in the doctrine of nationalism, yes, you heard me, nationalism, foreigners have to respect the laws of the land. You never change your laws of your land in nationalism for the foreigner. They adapt if they want to come in and adjust. That's the doctrine of nationalism. Yes, nationalism God promotes. They're not supposed to impose their foreign gods as the dominant belief system on a nation that's already established. That's against the Word of God, just so you know. I've taught that principle before. I know it rubs some liberal pulpits the wrong way. Oh, well, again, am I your enemy for telling you the truth? Jeremiah 19, 6, Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place will no longer be called Topath or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but rather the Valley of Slaughter because of what God's going to do. Topath is a place of burning fire or burning pit, it really means. It also doubled as a Hebrew term for a drum. Topath in the Valley of Hinnom pointed out the dung heap and the burning place just outside the gates of Jerusalem. So they already had an established 
dung, and I don't have to give you an explanation on that, in a burning place where the garbage and dung was burned at. Gehenna was one of the words used as well, a description of you know where, the lake of fire. But it was outside the gates. Now they turned it into a place of sacrifice as well. References Gehenna in the original context. But even as a drum, if you look at the definition of a drum, a drum is almost like a, 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 a pit, which some scholars believe could mean the shape of a pit or the fact that many rituals involved beating drums and chanting out loud. That's part of the rituals as well. Either way, this means they had established a place. This was a permanent structure, sacrifice of children. They turned their junk-burning junkyard outside the gates and they made a little section of it just for sacrifice under bowel systems. Sacrifice of children and virgins and people and babies. Jeremiah 19, 7. I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies, by the hand of those who seek their life. And yes, by the way, one of the cycles of discipline, when you're under God's cycles of discipline, a nation is under the cycle of discipline, enemies start to overthrow the land. You become captive in one realm or another. Jeremiah 19, 7, I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem. In other words, their government and what they're doing will start to fall apart in this place. I will cause them to fall by the sword, meaning enemies come in by force, by the hand of those who seek their life. I will give over their carcasses as food for the birds of the sky and beasts of the earth. Jeremiah 19, 8, I will also make this city a desolation, an object of hissing. Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and hiss because of its disaster. Hiss means those mean little whispers. Look at that. Look at that over there. It's horrible. Oh, that's what it talks about in verse 8. Jeremiah 19, 9. I will make them eat. This is a prophecy, folks. It happened. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. You want to sacrifice little children and babies? God says, I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters. They will eat one another's flesh in the siege and the distress with which their enemies and those who seek their life will distress them. In other words, this is coming, folks. Get prepared because you've wallowed in self-induced misery long enough and you keep building these Baal temples and abusing the children and abusing people and getting involved in worship outside of what I've taught you, now the discipline comes in. This prophetic statement right here on the board would happen because the Assyrians and Babylonians were at odds over territory battling and Judah would be overrun and starved at one point. In other words, the food supplies would be cut off. It's prophetic. It happened. And yes, some ate their own. Play games with God, see what happens. Jeremiah 19.10, Then you are to break the jar in the sight of the, the men who accompany you. Remember the earthen jar? God is the maker of everything. He's the potter. He can break it. Jeremiah 19.11, Say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Just so I will break this people in this city, even as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be again repaired, and they will bury in Topath in that fire in the pit, because there is no other place for burial. In other words, you made a nice little section of fire over there for sacrifice. You'll be burnt over there as well. Jeremiah 19, 12. This is how I'll treat this place and its inhabitants, declares the Lord, so as to make this city topath, a burning pit of fire, a drum of fire, a dung heap. A burning fit of what? Fit, uh, pit, excuse me, of what? Stench, debris, human sacrifice. Now, child sacrifice occurs where there is great demonism, demonic presence. Don't ever be fooled. Don't ever think it's something, well, one time he messed up. Let me tell you something. Anybody that beats a child or sexually abuses a child, does anything with a child, it is some form of demonic influence or possession going on there. And where the phallic cult, the sexual perversion exists, is in full swing, it happens. Human sacrifice was a staple of many ancient cultures and in smaller pockets of the Middle East and African as well as Aztec cultures, this carried on well into the second century and beyond. I'll leave it up there. I know these are tough principles to swallow. This is not going to be a series you're going to feel 
uh, warm and fuzzy about, I hate to tell you. It's going to talk about some realities that have happened and that continue to happen, sadly. Child sacrifice occurs where there is great demonism, where the phallic cult, sexual perversion, the worship of sexual perversion is in full swing. Human sacrifice was a staple of many ancient cultures and in smaller pockets of the Middle East, different areas, African and Aztec cultures, this carried on well into the second century. Yes, it did, and beyond. And beyond. Tough to swallow. Just so you understand these principles. Things go on today. This is where they came from. Just so you know. Child sacrifice as well as pedophilia were part of ancient history. Demon. Ancient history. It was not uncommon for sexual rituals or even child brides to be forced into indecent acts as young as 8 or 10 years old. Yes, I said eight or ten years old. I know I'm, I'm, I'm doing a dramatic pause. I want you to think about these things. Eight or ten years old. Among the brides of the Prophet Muhammad in Islam, if you study your history, you know your history. I wrote some of these things in my book, Discerning Our Time. It was an 11-year-old girl that he made into a bride. Many believe it was his blood relative, possibly a cousin, or maybe it was a, a cousin's child that he decided to make a bride, and he had about... 11 or 12 wives at one time, several of them well under the teenage years, one 11 years old. Stuff has been around a long time. Satan's been around a long time. This stuff has been around a long time. Satan has been around a long time, just so you know. Sorry if this is a tough series on you. We got to go into, we're going to get some good aspects of this series because I'm going to talk about how to recover from child abuse. Maybe you're a victim of some of these things. We can talk about the healing process. I'll try to do that in this series, but we have to look at the ugly truth of all this as well. Both the Romans and the Greeks, Romans and the Greeks during the first century and into the second century partook in sexual orgies and ritualistic worships of their gods. And they brought teens and preteens into the orgies as well. Nothing new under the sun. Satan's been around a long time. That's part of their rituals. Yes, a lot of people don't want to talk about that part of history. Human slave markets, sex trafficking, human slave markets, sexual abuse of children became a staple of the followers of Muhammad in the 6th and 7th centuries and carried into the 12th and 13th centuries where the Europeans decided to get into the human slave market. So often people want to blame founding fathers in America for doing some of the stupid things they might have done concerning this issue. Where it came from and where it became promoted as a money-making market was actually sometime around the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th century. And there was a guy named Muhammad and his followers that really blew it out of proportion and made a lot of money doing that type of evil. Just so you know, human trafficking's been around a long time. Sexual trafficking of children, a long time. Satan has been around a long time. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Let us be able to digest these difficult principles, Father, and be aware that Satan is always active. He always has been active, Father. Let us know our history so we do not repeat the same things over and over again, Father. Let us be the strong ones that carry that torch of truth forward so we can enlighten others. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.